Thank you very much, Amit, for, for the introduction, because I think you, you stated the problem very well uh, due to recent events like the COVID, but also to technological advances, it became clearer and clearer that data protections uh, rules on laws when maybe simply not enough. And uh, I think you you, you, step, you you placed the discussion at exactly the right level that I will try to address today. Uh, it also reassures me because I know I was speaking to an audience of technologists, so I was uh, hoping that you don't expect me to show you codes about how governance should be done. It's really more the vocabulary language on higher level, how it should be described. So I'm Philippe Page. I'm the third co-founder of the Human Colossus Foundation with Paul and Robert, which you heard in the previous weeks. And uh, my background is actually not in governance directly, but I had the chance to witness two uh, big changes in uh, the digital transformation. The first one in the 90s in the scientific area, where uh, the importance of actually sharing accurate data within the scientific community uh, was working close to CERN in Geneva in the, at that time was something really important and I could witness how important it, could, it was to create really global cooperation on science. Then uh, I turned to, to banking as many Swiss physicists do actually. And within the banking sector for about 10 to 15 years, I have been always involved in uh, developing new uh, processes, a new uh, organization and the, the, clearly the governance of the bank itself was really impacted by the digital transformation itself. And uh, this is the experience I bring into the Human Colossus Foundation. So this talk is really appending the first two talks that were given by Paul and Robert. No knowledge for this talk is necessary to understand the talk I will be talking about, except for the fact that uh, the first two talks really gives the technological substance to our uh, distributed data governance model. And here on this slide, I just want to stop a second on the word distributed. It's not a typo. It's clearly diff different from decentralized because as I will show you in a few minutes, I think that's something that is very important when we speak about data governance, the dis distributed element of many users, many people and actually multi-jurisdictional ecosystem interlacing with each other, which makes it very hard to actually build uh, a proper data governance. So in the set of three talks here today, we are at the top of the pyramid where uh, uh, we are really dealing with governance, which basically we see as the element giving veracity on every information coming from an information system. Veracity is a really purely human uh, word that a human decision maker will have to decide whether the information they get or they're dealing with is the right one. Or is uh, sufficiently good to be able to decide. So <clears throat> the, the talk really focused, try to give a flavor what type of governance model needs to be uh, applied when you are working really in an environment that has a multi-stakeholder policy making. So you need to define different rules that have to work together. And that's why, that's why it's more for a distributed data ecosystem. For a large company, it could also be uh, useful inside the, uh, a more close in, in, uh, environment because uh, multinationals, for example, also face these uh, multi-jurisdictional questions when they develop internal system. So what is data governance? Well, data governance, there are many type of uh, definitions here. Uh, we can just quote one, which is actually one we, we are uh, not using every day, but we find it pretty good. And it comes from the Data Governance Institute. And it basically stated in very simple, not simple, but that's a general term what data governance is. The system of this decision rights and accountabilities for information related processes executed according to agreed upon models which describe who can take what actions with what information on when, under what circumstances, and using what methods. So that's a, like a wishful thinking. We always, when we develop a system, having all these aspects contained in, into a set of rules that we know the system will follow. But if we want to go to a more functional description of what is data governance, I think we have to start with something that is a little bit more known. So that's why I will start with the concept of an enterprise, a company, look at a company of any size, because there 
the data governance is something very tangible. It's a set of policies, of rules, of regulation within the enterprise, which the enterprise is somehow free to develop themselves because these are internal rules. These rules obviously are within a, within a jurisdiction. They have to respect external laws, but it's still the enterprise that decides uh, its government's model in function of its goal. But it also goes with all the procedures to enforce that. And the point I wanted to stress is that a governance is not only a document. It's a set of documents or maybe uh, rules, but uh, there is also this enforcement aspect. And but also the human aspect of this that is to make the governance has work, you need the involvement of many layers of the company that goes from the steering committee, which usually have the involvement of some senior management because it's about defining which risk level we want to take within a company. And then representative, which I call here data representative, but it's really representative from every pieces of the company with their own perspective about how information, which is digitally represented with data is uh, used within the company. So uh, many companies have are spending a lot of money actually in building this data governance. And the point I want to stress for the discussion of uh, evolving uh, data governance into the, the, the new uh, open world of internet we have currently is that this data governance is always balanced with the business interest. I mean, the two things and other uh, concept are part of the overall data management strategy of the enterprise. And the point here is that enterprise are not designed to make the perfect data governance in the end the bet the, the, to be simple to be uh, simply stated the goal is to do better business for an enterprise so there is this uh, joining of a different uh, aspect that will also influence the data governance data governance is not simply uh, something that is standing on its side things get a little bit more complicated when you have Obviously, sharing uh, data between enterprise, which these days is mostly almost all the time because uh, data is flowing between third parties and the larger company have also to, to be responsible of about how they share the data. So this is usually done through data agreements, which is maybe another layer of complexity to add in each enterprise data governance and has legal aspect, commercial aspect, but also simply operational aspect. How can we actually share this data? But here again, it's uh, another layer of business interest that we mix with data governance to define better business. Then uh, things get more complicated when uh, you are looking at the ecosystem in which enterprise are working. And because on top of this business and governance interest, you also have the ecosystem interest. Think, for example, uh, the airline, industry or the travel industry, where you will have enterprises in uh, very different jurisdiction, even within a single country. I mean, I come from Switzerland, where tourism is a huge industry. Well, even different states in Switzerland have not slightly different rules. So as a hotel chain, you have to follow up with a number of different uh, business practice. So here I put simply business code of conduct, because it's not, not always enforceable rules, but they could also be professional best practices. And all this actually influenced the data governance. So obviously for the people that have to build a system that must respect the data governance, the interaction becomes even more complex. And all this up to now, I didn't even mention data protection regulation because this was like enterprise language, how uh, an, an enterprise actually deals with the data without really looking at the customers or the citizen if, you look at the state as an enterprise. <clears throat> and the data protection regulation are actually one of the largest misnomer in the field because data protection, it's not about protecting data, it's about protecting the people and which gives the personal data. That's how it started. So when uh, it comes to include into this set of data governance rules, the protection of the customers, the protection of the citizens. That's where you drive the whole uh, concept of uh, the regulation of the ecosystem in which the citizens or your customers are living. And this is something a bit more complex that started to really become important uh, about 30 years ago. And we all, I mean, and it's, I was mentioning before the discussion you're having in India right now. In Switzerland, we do not have a discussion on, um, on data protection 
lowest this day. It has been revised last year. It was created, there was one since 30 years, but evolution required a significant revision. And I found kind of amusing to see that currently we are still speaking about it. And I put this quote of an American pollster, Louis Harris, and the important point on this quote, I think is the date, uh, 1979. In 1979, he put this quote out, most Americans these days feel that unless something is done urgently, we might collectively arrive in 1984 on right on time. Here, 1984 was a reference to George Orwell book, 1984, and the big brother uh, threats of a system that will be a total surveillance system. And I feel, well, about, <coughs> more, than 30, uh, about 30, yes, uh, more than 30 years later, um, well, we are still discussing it while the landscape has completely changed. Remember 1979, this was the first IBM PC, personal computer, the first Apple II came out around that time. So the landscape was totally different. And already at that time, some people felt this was a problem. So if we want to go back to, because we are actually discussing it from a technological aspect, not from an economic or political aspect about what needs to be done with data protection uh, laws. It is clear that this mess, this mesh of various low, low regulations, whether the entity-based, enterprise-based, country-based, people-based, this is very difficult to, to isolate something that you can call data protection and that simply deals with personal data. Just looking at that, people involved in the personal data regulation know that it's not enough, that you need to go further than that. And so I try to summarize some, uh, by the way, can you see my slides? Yes. Hey, hello. Okay, yeah, because I just got a message on my screen. I just got a message from my screen saying that now you can see my slides. Did you see them before? Yeah, everything good for you. Okay. Yeah. okay. So the, the, the problems of data governance could be summarized uh, as follows. There is first the micro level, which is the, the road I took before, because that was a very tangible world, what to release uh, data governance to data protection. And that this micro level really seems how things happen in an enterprise, how things happen with citizen customers. Here, uh, the, the numbers of regulations and complexities on interaction really give rise to a highly complex uh, ecosystem. And this is translating to rising costs, not only in monetary terms, but in human terms, you need more and more uh, people in compliance or in various uh, areas to actually take care of these data governances. But the worst uh, problem is I think the eroding trust that uh, people have in actually this uh, data governance because the protection is often not felt. It is very hard to convince someone, for example, a patient in the medical sector, that his data that he's willingly pro proposing to share for research purpose will be shared only for research purposes and will not go further and maybe be used in, uh, for other purposes he's not aware of. So this erosion of trust really slows innovation because uh, it's getting very hard to get adoptions and it is also uh, uh, behind actually the, the threat of having new innovation, sharing more data as, it, as the technology will allow. Uh, and this has very uh, practical consequences. Uh, for example, going back to a medical uh, sector example, now we could bring so much data on your mobile device that your mobile device actually become a medical device. Medical devices are being regulated very differently than mobile phones. Uh, I'll let you imagine the complexity of some people that are developing apps that actually bring uh, this type of information on mobile devices. So that's the micro level. And by the way, I didn't touch the cybersecurity aspect, the simple uh, stealing of data. This is, uh, I think, a different topic, but it's also part of all the, this uh, question that are rising costs on slow uh, and, uh, and eroding trust in information system. But I think uh, we also have a more macro level problems when it comes to governance is that because we are living into a world that is more and more interconnected, most of the application developed today will require the connection with 
another stakeholder. And this multi-stakeholder environment translates very often into a multi-jurisdictional environment. And the, the best example, uh, which I don't have to explain much, was the travel pass related to COVID-19. It was very hard actually to, to build a travel pass that would be available uh, globally without either centralizing the data into a provider or into a, a, a trust provider in that everyone has to agree. So you need to get everyone agreeing that this is the center of trust. And usually the center of trust doesn't want to take this responsibility uh, globally. So it slows down the process. Uh, <clears throat> and also uh, it, it doesn't really take into account the detailed needs of every user of a system, people who are simply traveling, didn't maybe have the fear of data protection, they just wanted to travel. So it creates really a tension between the user need, the user demand, and what actually will actually be done. And this is what uh, I mean, but growing complexity on the macro level uh, being attached to this uh, multi-jurisdictional agreement being slow. And by the way, this is not only relevant for digital transformation, uh, if we look at another aspect uh, which we worked on was the, the, the global uh, passport for vaccination. Uh, we, uh, at the Human Colossus Foundation, one of our first projects was regarding uh, the yellow fever vaccination because the WHO had uh, created over, over 20 years ago the first passport, this little passport, this little yellow booklet uh, that uh, ensure that uh, you can travel because it proves you have been vaccinated against yellow fever. This little booklet had never been properly or adequately uh, digitalized, despite it's a very it's a small piece of cardboard. And the reason it was never properly uh, uh, digitalized was no one could uh, actually build one uh, global framework where the things would be available globally. And WHO could just do what they could, have it in five languages. And initially, it was only for this. Uh, vaccination because this vaccination was the only one that was agreed upon all over the world. And this is important to note that depending on any data governance, depending on any um, uh, auth authentication, any exchanges, there is usually a trust, an existing trust element that allows the system to be built. And these trust elements are between uh, governments between uh, independent legal entities, and they must exist usually before you go to the digital space. And this is this is sometimes uh, forgotten that it's not the digital credential that will give you the trust. It's actually a rep digital representative of an existing trust. And obviously, this is another point coming as a problem uh, in the erosion of trust. It's more on the economical side because of the way uh, trust is enabled in digital system. We see a, uh, a centralization of trust on a certain uh, number of platforms. Some of these platforms, when we think in social media, are hugely concentrating uh, power on users. So the network effect uh, is starting to, to bring some kind of platform locking, which is then uh, creating a problem for all the businesses. On that. So this, these are, I think, the two side micro level problems, macro level problems, but they are both reflected in, in really a growing complexity that is very hard to build anything on it. But also, uh, and I think more importantly, this erosion of trust that uh, really blocks the development of information system at a time. We all expect actually uh, digitalization to help against big problems like uh, global warming, all these problems that require actually collaboration at the scale of the planet will benefit of sharing more and more data. Now, if we want to have a look at the technological aspect of what uh, we think they are the origin of the problem, and here this is really the work we, we have been doing for the last two years as part of the Human Colossus Foundation, is to develop this thinking that there is something to designs uh, of the current internet that have not been scaled fast enough to to respond to the actual success of internet. Remember uh, <clears throat> that internet is about 30 years old and half of the world population is now connected. And that's, uh, on top of that, now you have all the IoT devices. So uh, I think in less than, than a generation, a huge impact on the society as a whole uh, was created by this uh, internet protocol. 
this protocol with uh, the evolution of the IT, but we can use 1964 as uh, maybe uh, an important date. Uh, that's the publication date uh, by at the time. I, I took this graph uh, from Paul Barons in his run corporation uh, notes uh, on the subject. At the time, they were trying to create a physical network that will secure the communication uh, it was in the US. Uh, and it, the, the threat was the nuclear threat and they wanted decentralization of, the, they choose decentralization of the network as the, the, the response to secure the networks, going from centralized networks to decentralized network and distributed network. Mm -hmm. So on the information, on the physical networks, I think we clearly have reached the distributed uh, uh, level in many areas when you look at the number of mobile devices and uh, the amazing computation power that are in these, in these devices. And I will even say that compared to these 1964 pictures, uh, the connections are even bigger than what was expected because every node, every node we see on the right is actually potentially connected to every other node, not simply to nodes in his, its neighborhood. Uh, so this led a transition from very static system, which were dependent on a centralized source of calculation to very uh, uh, dynamic system uh, that are actually evolving coherently. But I put almost in red because we are not almost there. And we feel that, that today when you deal uh, with uh, your, uh, especially when we speak about personal data, which we can always think about data that sits on, uh, that can sit potentially on your mobile device. We know that we have to always go through platforms to always uh, pay some, you're not totally free to basically peer to peer um, uh, transaction or calculation or uh, communication as this diagram will imply. And the, the reason for that I think are known by, by most uh, technologists is uh, it's related to the authentication. We are still living in the world, the old world of the login the account, which makes total sense when you have a centralized system. The centralized system knows its users simply by having an account and logging on the user. There was no problem with that. Obviously, authentication followed the, the evolution to the decentralized system. And I think the self-sovereign identity authentication system, this movement is one of the most advanced currently that try to, to push the authentication on the networks into a decentralized method. But interestingly, for the authentication, losing this uh, concept of logging an account is very hard. Not well, it's it's a hard engineering problem, that's for sure. But it's an even harder economic problem because a lot of the platforms or a lot of the businesses that have been built around the internet these days do need actually to concentrate uh, the authentication on their platforms to keep their uh, their customer or in that that's maybe the, the worst problem, the reuse of the data, because they actually make the benefits or the value for the platform is not actually the value for the user of the platform, it's the, the value of the data of the user of the platform. So the secondary usage of data has an important economic impact for many uh, uh, businesses based on uh, using uh, on the, um, digital businesses. Uh, and that creates back a certain centralization that in the sense that uh, the, uh, there's platforms still around on bigger platforms get tend to, be, to get bigger. So that's why I put the arrow basically going both ways. If technologically we could go to self-sovereign identity, there's an economic uh, burden that, that slow this, uh, uh, this problem. And that goes back to uh, um, concentrate basically uh, the authentication to global provider. And <clears throat> Obviously, I didn't mention, but I think it's kind of obvious to issue the more you centralize uh, these, um, these authentication methods, uh, the more uh, risk you have uh, on the cyber security side, but also simply on the failure risk because you have a single point of failure in your system. And I will say this is this authentication, decentralized authentication question is rather mature question because this self-sovereign identity movement has expanded. There is experiment taking place in virtually um, in many countries, in Canada, in the US, in Europe, and uh, part of some open source discussion. Basically, uh, we have members from all over the world. 
a discussion that is not taking place so openly is the one on semantic because it is a thorny problem. Uh, it's harder maybe to, to grasp what's the meaning, but uh, we can use the same, uh, same diagram. Uh, the same diagram, semantic on the left, centralized, basically you have a standard. In the sense, it's easy. Every node is connected to the same standard, and that works perfectly well when you are in a totally centralized fashion. When it gets uh, decentralized, and here you can think about actually different networks having to interact and share data. Um, I'm going back to the medical sector, where actually the the data standards will differ per jurisdiction or per uh, domain of the industry. The pharmaceutical industry doesn't use the same standard of um, as the, the hospital or the healthcare industry, um, health provider industry. So yeah, so that the solution, you see some standards like HL7 that are becoming more and more important, but having one standard globally basically makes it harder and harder to respect the, the, uh, the diversity of each of the environment of, of each of the jurisdiction in which it is applying. So it is getting costly. The importance is this interconnection between standards. And obviously, the, the work of being able to connect two nodes on the networks without referring to a standard was studied since quite some time, but uh, it is much harder to define the, the meaning of the data if uh, you uh, don't have a standard to directly adhere to. So this is where the, at the Human Colossus Foundation, that was the, the topic of the presentation of Paul uh, about decentralized semantic and this uh, solution which we are looking at, this layered architecture that would provide actually a way uh, for having a higher level of decentralization in the semantics. So the, the aim in that area, uh, as Paul declared, is really to have a peer-to-peer -peer relationship this possibility of defining which standard you are using peer-to-peer, -peer, not relying on the platform. So this is fine. And we see technology is going the right way to the decentralized, uh, where we have more and more power to the entity. So when we come to personal data, this will explain why uh, we have uh, basically could put more and more power into this uh, data protection law. But actually there is an important fact to realize mm. is Governance is about how people interact, how people cooperate and uh, the evolution, whatever uh, society uh, you are living in, whatever culture, that's not how, that's not how humans evolve. Humans always evolve in the, the other sense. They start by individual tribes, gathering tribes. That started to be larger and larger community. And the centralization here is actually uh, the authority against which the, the tribe gather or the citizen around the country. And the more we advance, the more uh, we have centralized uh, structure. The biggest one I think I could think of will be now the United Nations, where basically every country is supposed to follow the rules. That they, it's a very complex one. But <clears throat> the life of everyone is not dictated only by the top level or the most centralized one. There's this whole layers of uh, of governances that are put in a various level. But the point is here, it all starts with, you know, from the other side, it starts really from the, the central node, the, the humans, if you want, the human create structure, which are more and more complex, and then each structure becomes the node from the next level. Uh, so the, <clears throat> in this, what I mean by that is that humans will create a company, like a uh, certain and the company, then when it deals with other company, it's company to company. You don't go down to the human all the time. So uh, that means that when you are designing governance, we should not follow the technology road. The technology road started from centralized to distributed to build physical networks. But governance is more about how humans exchange information and should go the other way around, start with individual and build stronger and larger and larger community. And uh, I put this complexity a row because uh, to show really the complexity goes in both in the opposite direction. So whether we want to address both the micro level or the, uh, the micro or the macro level of uh, uh, the governance problem, it might be well to start first with the, the existing trust framework, the existing human trust framework uh, that start with the individual and build larger and larger structure. And that was the idea we have uh, worked on 
between uh, behind this distributed governance uh, system. So to have a quick uh, explanation why the two first call actually make this model actually uh, buildable is that through the first bottom layer, the semantic layer, it was all about object integrity. We have tools now to better preserve the context when data is being captured. And when the data is being kept, is being harmonized at the capture level, it helps actually to be very clear about which data is being transferred. The meaning of the data is being uh, more deterministic, which means you have tools to better capture the context in which the data was captured before it's being reused. And the, uh, the next, the, the input layers that was presented by, by Robert, it's all about decentralized authentication, yes, but not authentication only of the people or the actors or the controllers, as we see on the networks. It's also about the authentication of the events. So this is why we spoke about authentic events. And from the governance papers, uh, aspect, you can build a decentralized system of authentic events, which looks a lot like causality. Causality in the real world allows everyone to judge that this event happens before the next or after. And context and causality are the two fundamental aspects of any legal framework. You can't build, try to build a legal framework where you don't know who did what and when. That's not possible. So this is why if you think of in, in these terms, first of object integrity and then of event authenticity, you can rebuild these two core aspects of a governance. And how we actually phrase that is, it creates this notion of digital self. Uh, digital self meaning that a governance can apply like a regulation to that person at that time in that context, and then you can define it. So equipped with this concept of digital self, which at the most, a uh, basic level will be like an active wallet that holds some credentials that can, but I mean by active wallet, I will mean the, the wallet will know whether the credential is used in the correct. Or, uh, so this is not, the, we don't really use the, the term wallet, but it's at the lowest level, that's uh, how you could think of it. This is what's protecting actually the entity that is living uh, and subject to this governance, whether it's an individual, a company or government dealing I typically always come back to the COVID passport, the travel pass, dealing at international level with other peers, with other governments. <clears throat> so having isolated that, I uh, also flash here these pictures that people that were on the first two talks will see. The governance domain is clearly split, but depends on intimately connected with the inputs and semantic domains. Uh, that's where we define the rules and how these rules are connected to objects and events. So our aim in actually building this concept of distributed data governance that starts with from the individual is really to provide a powerful solution for all multi-stakeholder collaboration. But we want this collaboration to be based on transparent rules and regulation, whatever they are. There must be a way to embed them, whether they come from contract law, from privacy law, or from uh, international uh, regulations. And this will enable actually the sharing of the data across the ecosystem. So um, uh, the presentation, I think, will be available online, so I will not go to the details. But the important point is that the distributed data governance is really like an operational framework in which uh, the solution could be built. The visible part of the, the, the data govern, distributed data governance is what we call the data governance administration. That's where we have, I'll say a few words after that, where really the action takes place, where we connect actually uh, the stakeholders to specific registries or uh, uh, where some uh, governance is enforced or some credential are being issued. So to go, uh, we'll not go too much into the, into the technology, but how does it work actually, this notion of distributed data governance model that starts really with the individual, me as an individual, I'm part of various ecosystem, I'm a citizen of India, I'm a, I'm a father, I'm a mother, I am working in that company, I'm traveling in another country, we are always interacting with multiple governance, but how does this user actually can connect to these various uh, governances, and this is where we have this concept of ecosystem. So. 
my user, we have to be very clear on the networks. What distinguishes us from a machine is very little. We are all uh, bits of information traveling on the network. So here at Human Colossus, we redefine slightly the word autonomic agents. Uh, autonomic agent being this notion that the agent is actually capable of free will deciding. And this is crucial for governance. There is no governance if you don't have an implementation and enforcement of the governance which leads to accountability. And if you think of it, this is somehow related to the choice you are making when you do an action or not. So that's why what we call autonomic agent, actually agents which have a free will. So it's obviously for individuals, but it's also for an organization that within its ecosystem has the will to decide to do this business or to do another business or for a sovereign entity to develop this uh, uh, relationship with that entity or not. So there is some kind of free will at the entity level that applies when you have this mechanism of choice. So this is what we call these agents, which are represented here in this diagram as the data subject. And the, the ecosystem has basically then, uh, you have enterprise or companies, people doing stuff, let's put it simply like that. But we split them into, you have the purpose driven, service provider, the uh, companies that actually have a purpose to do something. You will exchange data for them, but for a specific purpose, which has separate from the insights based service provider, which are just analyzing the data, analyzing this information. I think that's an important split when you want to clarify the governance aspect. Because on one side, you have the data captures, while on the other side, you have the data analysis. And these are two things that needs to be bound together by the proper governance. This is what the data governance is important about. So here, the blue circle represents the legitimate authority that as part of, if you are part of an ecosystem, maybe you don't agree, but you recognize a certain authority that governs the ecosystem. You most probably never interact with the authority, but the authority will issue the constitution, will issue the regulation, will issue the things that the data governance administration can work on. And then, an ecosystem is simply a set of members. Uh, any members, these are all uh, bubbling in green, uh, which is glued together by this administration, uh, data governance administration itself responding and being the visible face of the authority behind. And, and two important points. First, everything in this ecosystem has to be peer to peer. The data subject discussed with the purpose driven service provider the way he wants, he doesn't rely on the data governance authority to be able to discuss with the purpose-driven provider. Typically in the health sector, again, uh, I can go to a medical doctor and I have my chat with him. It's only when I want to check that this doctor, he's actually a certified doctor that I will need data governance administration to be able uh, to have issued, in this case, a credential to the doctor that he can share with me. Okay, this is actually a doctor from from that, uh, following that type of rules. So the, the, the important aspect is that uh, everything is based on peer-to-peer -peer connection to respect this individual aspect. But the other important point is that the, the data subject can, will be member of multiple ecosystems, mostly at the same time. So you are not attached to one single ecosystem for your entire digital life. Yeah. And, an example that we can say uh, where this will be useful to have this type of system is to respond to this type of question. How can we integrate a digital consent to exchange data for a given purpose into existing rules and regulation across multiple jurisdictions? With this peer-to-peer -peer relationship between here the citizen and its guardian, maybe uh, that we can discuss later, and, and a specific purpose-driven service provider like an airline company, uh, hospital, <clears throat> what data is actually available to be exchanged uh, for a company that will actually use uh, analytics on that has to be governed and this could be actually built with the data governance administration. That's a little bit the use case we are following. An example uh, we can give of this multi uh, ecosystem uh, belonging of each individual. Let's take the case of a patient. The patient is the, the data subject, the principal. Uh, most of the actions in terms of healthcare are taking place uh, with the doctor. That's 
where we have this guardianship relationship also available in the digital thing. Guardians in the sense that the doctor has a specified, specific relationship concerning only your health data. <clears throat> so she can actually act on your behalf uh, in some cases. This is why we use the term guardianship. And uh, how they interact with a uh, hospital. Let's see if you think here the example I will we can use is simply how a birth certificate uh, will be issued uh, with some analysis. So you have the hospital that is healthcare purpose based service provider, and the governance. I took this example from the work we are doing in Europe, uh, where in Europe we have the European Medical Agency uh, that is basically the regulator of the healthcare sector. So they would define what data could be shared for that profession, but in this healthcare environment. Um, and uh, WHO might do a statistic and which data they will be able uh, available for that statistic with the proper anonymization will actually be defined actually at the level of the governance for that specific uh, purpose. But the same person, same patient uh, will have a different governance administration when it comes, for example, to the production of his birth certificate. Uh, when your child uh, here in the case of uh, childbirth, the patient would have birth is not a, a disease. So here it's not a patient, but the baby is represented by his parents, the guardian, the hospital, that's where you get your birth attestation. Uh, but it's the French government that defines what is a birth certificate that is issued by the state departments, which here could be seen as the uh, inside state service provider. So it's this interaction of multiple governances, but on the same person in the end uh, that we aim to, to build. And here, uh, we to, to make it work, this this uh, <clears throat> this, centralized, this, uh, this data governance administration have to respect a certain number of principles to be able to determine which are the reputable actors, uh, the accountability aspect, what data can be searched, and the monitoring of the data request is an important aspect to avoid surveillance in places where you don't want to do that on all the consent uh, measurements. And mm -hmm. in the end, because we had this world of consensual veracity at the top of our pyramid. It's simply to indicate that when you start your data, your governance model from the individual moving down, uh, the, moving up the complexity ladders with multiple ecosystem, this concept of digital self allows you to connect with multiple governance, which are maybe totally independent. They might be related, but you don't care because you are the one actually to choose how to share some data from one governance, uh, for, from one information system to the other one, which might depend on different information, uh, different self-governance. So as a conclusion, it's more to let you know the status of the work we are doing. Now, the, the model has been basically uh, established uh, in terms of blueprint based on the work done on decentralized semantic and decentralized authentication. And now we are busy building the base component of what we call the data governance administration. Here I put October 2022. Uh, so that you, no one asked me to do a presentation on that before, mm. because uh, we are actually building the, these uh, these things based on uh, on the uh, on use case which we have around us in the medical sector, where we hope actually to to demonstrate how you can build a data governance starting from the individual and respecting the existing trust frameworks, whether they are data protection law, but also contract law or other type of uh, laws that will be around. Well, Philip, this was really great. Uh, thank you so much for uh, sharing uh, sharing this overarching view around that. So I think we have um, we have a few questions. Uh, I think Sankrishan has posted on the chat, but let me kind of say it out for um, for everyone on the stream. You know, uh, so one of the challenges uh, around this topic is that usually we start with these conversations around data management, but not governance. So let's say we talk from the bottom up, like we talk much more about the schemas, we talk much more about maybe authentication, uh, but not so much about the, the top part of it, right? Um, mm -hmm. And we kind of get too much into, let's say, the tooling, you know, the the schema sharing mechanism, this uh, the 
around efforts around that and how would you think are there any directions in which we could elevate this conversation uh, around data governance um you know to start top down as opposed to bottom up or is that not the right way i mean you know is that uh he I was about to say yes or no. So <laughs> I think there must be a top-down approach to realize that the standard way of doing data protection might not be sufficient for the next level of interaction we want to have. So that, that's more top-down. You need to have actually the willingness mm -hmm. to, to try to change. Mm -hmm. But then it somehow, from my point of view, it stops here because you have first to try it out on a small scale to detect every possible, uh, what it means for your enterprise. So right. um, this is actually uh, not, uh, if I agree that the word distributed governance might sound a little bit disruptive, actually the, 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 the management theory to actually implement it is already known. It has been around for some years. If you follow, for example, principle like the, the Cotter model, Mm -hmm. dual cutter model this if you look into the details of how these things work out where you create this uh, first quick win localize you involve your enterprise you involve everyone in the in the change management mm -hmm. uh, one of the big problem when you apply the cutter model is how do you make the information flow because suddenly you mix managing directors with technicians basically you create the team to create this uh, little pocket in the enterprise of change management so the here again the, the the, 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 the distributed governance model works perfectly well because instead of having simply individual, you basically have your employees and you, you the top management define the vision, the longer term goal, and then there is this mm -hmm. smaller team that will work and start sharing on there. You will meet the engineers that work on the schema meeting. And I think the, that, that's the methodology which we follow here. Uh, when we have to, to provide uh, advices, this, this idea, that, which is basically, uh, I mean, uh, we are putting our creativity into, into the data management, not really into the change management model. There is one which I had the chance actually to, to know a little bit more in detail that works perfectly well because there is this decentralization right. element. So I think one of the, one of the themes that I kind of want to talk about is, or at least question about is, <laughs> um, is this only re relevant for a largely regulated services, right? So, or is it also, you know, businesses that are really private and are looking at data, which is say non medical, which is, you know, under say regulated or sovereign data, like my identity documents, like a passport or not? But I'm a business and I'm trying to think about how to do this governance and build this ecosystem around the data or the topic that I'm collecting or I'm trying to manage. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the typical challenge that private or businesses don't do this is because of what we in the open source world call ossification, right? You Any standards, any regulation, ossify. And people want to move faster than what the standards can move at pace. So they try to, you know, don't want to adopt into a regulated standard. They want to build their own thing, stay separate, unless there is, you know, regulation or rules around a lot of these topics. And I think one of the question I have is like, really, if I'm a private business in a non-regulated business, uh, like not say financial services or medical services other than taxes and health. And I'm trying to build this system. What would you approach? Like, how would I, how would I, how should I go about it? Uh, because it's always faster to do it yeah. on my own, right? Like if yeah. I don't. So the, the, the good, clearly the good thing about the approach is that we start peer to peer. So that means you and your customer, whether, you, this, mm -hmm. you have a small business, it's you and your customer. Now, the first uh, hurdle is, okay, how does my customer knows these type of standards? But the, and the, it's basically around this digital self because you as a small company, you want to be sure that 
this small customer, whether it's regulated, on, will pay you. And you don't want necessarily to, to have to deal with the complexity of digital payment or other stuff. Right. So I think for small businesses, this, uh, this is the challenge, how we actually can be discovered on this system without having to be on Facebook, without having to be, how do, do the customers will discover you? That's, that's the right. biggest challenge. Uh, but once this, what we call this ambient infrastructure is in place, uh, normally small businesses will be able to innovate without having to think about data governance. They will just have to think about the governance in their own world. And if it's right. uh, unregulated sector, it's going to be a great asset for them because they don't have necessarily to be, as I said before, on Facebook, on Google, or on Amazon to be visible by the customers. Because <clears throat> as part of this peer-to-peer -peer, uh, mechanism, the idea is you really don't want to have an intermediary to authenticate yourself. You don't even want to have a blockchain in which your customer wants to be. So it's but all about the discovery mechanism. Let me challenge that question a little bit, notion a little bit. I mean, the... And maybe that that topic is for kind of the fourth layer, which is the incentive and economics. But you know, when we talk about peer to peer, you know, the power ratio between the service provider, the purpose driven service provider, or insight driven service provider, versus the end customer is really imbalanced, right? Um, so the the ability of the audience to know what they're trying to do. Um, you know, what's happening behind on all of this is really hard. And I, I think we can, I see that in, you know, at least in the Indian context and payments and all that, we, we're happy to use the payment infrastructure that's built, but what's the role around, you know, where that data is going? Is it, uh, you know, is it being managed properly? Uh, all of that stuff is really opaque and a little bit of opaqueness especially to the end customer who may not even care about it unless the rules and regulation are on that. So I was going from that and saying, even in regulated industry, it's really hard to do this. And I'm trying to think about how do we incentivize businesses to, to pick up? And I think Paul here mentions the first question is to really talk about what's the purpose of that distributed data ecosystem. Um, can we, you know, before, before we can pull in multiple stakeholders into the yeah. data governance administration. Um, maybe. And then we can define what the data capture should be to kind of do that. So maybe, maybe I'm not asking the right question, but uh, anyway, that, that was like kind of um, some of the thoughts that were emerging as you were talking through yours. Yeah. Maybe, maybe just to check if I understand the, the, well the question, we can take the example of the in the tourism industry, like a hotel mm -hmm. industry for the moment. Mm -hmm. In a hotel industry currently, when, uh, as a customer, if I want to uh, to go somewhere, there's a high chance that I will end up in one of the the booking platforms that are around. Why? Mm -hmm. Because of simplicity, and I don't really care about my data. It's only after the trip that when I start to get to realize that actually uh, there's much more spam coming to me. But right. the initial thing you go and you just on why don't I go to this hotel that a friend told me about? Because it's harder to find. You could Google it, but it's still harder to find. So this platform has certain use to find out. But this has a price for for the hotel industry. That is, they have to be on that on selected platforms and there is more than one. So they have to be visible on all platforms and there is negotiation behind the thing. So that's, that's why you get on some of these platform rooms that are cheaper than if you go directly to the hotel. Here, the idea of the distributed governance is that they could go on these platforms. That's perfectly fine. If this platform had, let's say, advices or car rental or the stuff, but why is the hotel not able to be visible simply for me as a user searching for hotel in Delhi? I come from Switzerland, I don't know anything about Delhi, but my uh, trusted digital assistant, this digital self, that's what I was speaking about, Active, knows that I'm looking for that. And advising on the system, like if you Google simply the, the, the basic of Google, where you just have this information, I think this is where we want to extend. With the big difference is that instead of having simply an information coming back, it is the information validated from the hotel. And by simplifying, having this simplification, uh, Ensuring that the, the research is not simply a search coming 
mm -hmm. my Google search that anyone could have created a template. No, I'm getting uh, the hotel I'm expecting to get. And this is technology based on legal entity identifier. So that's mm -hmm. just for the registration, that's just one thing. But the quality of the hotel, well, I can go to maybe an inside based service provider that is independent or that maybe the tourist industry could develop. But to start with just the website of the hotel, oh could be trusted and directly accessible. So mm -hmm. sometimes we were discussing about the user interface. How do you access disability governance? Actually, the user should not even see it. So uh, we draw a little boxes like the <laughs> initial Google search, which just right. is powered by human colossus. But the idea was you get accurate response coming back because the search is actually going to the place you want. That's the trusted digital assistant list, but the verification right. that it comes from the right piece comes. And this is where you need this uh, decentralized governance to ensure uh, all the, the credential, or as I said before, like a rating, this type of things. You need still a governance, which in this case will be like a tourist association, tourism association, or a registrar in, in the selected country. Right. That's why you need multiple governances that basically push back to get one answer in the end. Uh, mm. Okay, so I think uh, before we end, because we are really five minutes over, but let me let me I'll pose a last question, which is really important from, how do you see the current split on jurisdictional requirements that are coming around data control and data capture <laughs> with, you know, so, for example, Europe saying, uh, or in, in India, we, we, we want every payment data to be limited to India, stored in India. Similarly, in Europe, there's been a lot of tension around what kind of data has to be allowed to be shared with the US and not. Um, and more and more companies have to think about jurisdiction control, not only on protocols, but also on data storage. Uh, you know, even when they're designing their applications or building businesses. And, in some extent, that kind of uh, counters a little bit on how this, I mean, I, I don't know where that fits into the governance. So maybe, I mean, that's kind of right. one it, question. It, to it, end does, it does fit perfectly in. And actually the diagram I saw with the two complexity arrow going the wrong side was designed actually to address this question of data sovereignty at the country level. Because the loss of sovereignty, um, uh, we can use it as personal control, of it, but it's really important for right. an entity that is today called sovereign. So think of a state and it's actually a hot topic in many countries. How do they keep that data? And I don't know if it's English, it exists in English or if it's known in India, but there is this French expression, do not throw the baby with the water bath. Yeah. I think as soon as you try to limit the storing of the data, that means, why do you need digital data anyway? Because, yeah, it's going, digital is everywhere. It's ubiquitous. The power of digital is to transmit the main right. power. It's, you, and you have, don't have the notion of copy, original things can move fast. So when you want simply to store the data in India or in Switzerland, we have the same debate. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it helps, but actually it doesn't help. It doesn't really help. It's the governance <laughs> it which help. is on top. And this yeah. is where the, maybe we should do with Robert a specific uh, talk on what we call the ambient infrastructure, where you as an Indian citizen, uh, you will have certain access to data that no one else has, because mm -hmm. actually at the identifier level, this data, this data repository knows he can talk only to identify that present uh, uh, valid credential given by the sovereign government, the India in this mm -hmm. case. And that's where the, the, the slide Robert discussed, this connection of we as human with the software and the hardware is becoming important because for mm -hmm. that you need really to have hardware with some biometric identification because it's really at the bridge between physical and digital that you, you get the, the, mm -hmm. the, the potential threat. But otherwise, once you're in the digital space, I think it, these distributed models actually helps creating sovereignty. And uh, well, I come from Switzerland, so we have a very federal state. Yes. Canton, and this is this influenced the system that our central power is uh, uh, has clear rules which Canton do not have. And it was interesting. I was discussing that with Canadians recently about the digital passport, and it was interesting to see in Canada. Uh, 
they they don't delegate to the federal government the notion of identity card uh, as in Switzerland we do. So every culture will be slightly different. So uh, this distributed governance model is made to actually respect this federal layered structure of uh, okay. governance model. So Philippe, where, where can people find, uh, reach you or talk, you know, if they want to talk to you, you know, on email so, or on some federated yeah. social network, you know, whatever, okay. where can people so, reach you? Uh, uh, thanks for the question because I can do a little bit of advertising. Uh, first, <laughs> my email address is, is at the end of the presentation. So uh, at Human Colossus, please use that for direct contact, no problem. But uh, we are in the process of completely re rewamping our website to make it mm -hmm. easier to access us. So the, the website will be a nice entry point uh, for some information. Uh, and uh, we are currently at, within the Human Colossus Foundation, we are creating over the summer working groups that will be dealing with specific topics. And that's what we tried. Uh, the first uh, working group is really on this uh, decentralized semantic because there is a whole question about harmonizing legacy yeah. data and all this uh, that will be driven by uh, by Paul. And uh, I'm building up a first uh, working group on, uh, on distributed governance uh, to be live around October. Uh, and. Uh, Maybe I see Paul is on the call. He might not like that. I will try to staff this working group actually with people coming from the businesses, people coming from the government, so that the discussion is really a governance question that will be brought down to technology, not the converse. I'm not saying technologies will not be part of the working group, but I want the core group to be designed from the governance perspective, as I right. tried to show you. And these events so, would be, I'm guessing, on you can find more on humancolosis.org and if you yes. missed yes. Philip's email, philip.page at humanclosis.org. Yep. Um, well, thank you so much, Philip, um, and for this, um, you know, taking us through the distributed data governance. And I think the whole uh, series uh, over the last three weeks uh, around distributed semantics, distributed um, authentication, distributed governance, uh, has really set kind of, you know, a very nice framework. And as I keep saying, the vocabulary for us to, you know, talk about this topic and, mm -hmm. and build on it. And I really look forward to see more stuff that's come. And hopefully we'll do a sometime in the future, one on distributed economics. I don't know if that's kind of, um, you know, that I think incentives and economics is always uh, make or break in many cases is uh, in, in the human in the driving human uh, behavior. So, you know, we should probably should do another one on that. Um, for everyone on the call, if you, you know, you know how to reach all, uh, you know, people at Human Colossus, you can get an edited version of this talk if you want to share it with people <coughs> um, who haven't seen it. It's at hasgeek.com slash privacy mode slash data slash gov slash and slash sim. So basically go to hasgeek.com slash privacy mode and you will find uh, the data governance and semantic sessions where you'll see all the three talks that you can share. Uh, you can also comment out there if you have any comments around that. Well, Paul and Philippe, thank you so much. And, and to Robert, who's, who was there last week. Um, thank you so much for this. And well, thank you everyone for joining in and hopefully you continue your privacy discussions mm -hmm. and talk about distributed everything, <laughs> how to get more better at it, right? So thank you everyone, thank you, take care. Thank you.